Alex Hickey here with Hecho in Mexico and the author of The Devil's Highway, the great Luis Urea. How are you doing, Luis? I'm all right. Here in quarantine. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, <laughs> as good as it's going to get, I suppose. Yeah. All right. So do you want to start us off? Tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe what you're working on right now. And Sure. Um, let's see. I was born in Tijuana. I come from a neighborhood called Colonia Independencia, Tijuana, uh, raised in San Diego. My dad was Mexican. My mom was American, um, bilingual. Um, let's see, first person in my family to go to college and uh, did a lot of uh, relief work and missionary work in the Tijuana, northern Baja California region until I finally left that area in 1982. I have 18 books out. I've been super blessed. The last bunch of them have been bestsellers. And, you know, my latest book is called The House of Broken Angels. And uh, it's uh, coming out in amazing editions around the world, which is cool for me to see. You know, I just got the cover of my uh, Russian edition. Yesterday, oh. the Lithuanian cover came. <laughs> so that's nice. Um, I teach at University of Illinois, but Chicago, sort of because I'm on the road so much, except now that we're in lockdown. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm working on a long novel, uh, historical novel, based on my mother's Red Cross experience in World War II. Okay. So you've always had this kind of uh, humanitarian aspect to your family then? Um, you know, it, it, it came from, uh, actually, I think... I always had a heart for people in worse situations than we were. I didn't even know we were kind of poor, um, but we were. Um, but, you know, when I would meet indigenous people in Tijuana or beggars or so forth, my heart always broke for them. Um, and uh, my father died at the hands of Mexican police in 1977. And it was a very bad way to go. Um, and the police forced me to buy his corpse or they wouldn't let me have it, so I had to buy it, which was, um, you know, a little portrait of human evil I've never forgotten. And uh, I, I was in college, and I managed to get through college. It was my senior year. Um, and uh, although I wanted to be an author, above all things, I also was having trouble finding meaning after that tragedy. And uh, I was invited to go back to Tijuana with some relief workers, just to see. And at the time, I thought, well, you're not going to show me anything about Tijuana. You know, I am Tijuana. And uh, I, of course, saw things I, I didn't expect. And I spent a lot of time uh, in the Tijuana garbage dump and uh, orphanages, neighborhoods, uh, places where people needed help, uh, prisons, jails, uh, migrant centers, unaccompanied minors, all the things you hear about today I was involved with starting in 1977, 78. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm an old hand at that kind of stuff. And it just changed my direction. I think I, I joke with people when I'm on the road and, you know, doing, uh, my appearances that I, I had a daydream as a kid that I would be Robert Plant and Led Zeppelin or something, you know, <laughs> or, uh, you know, maybe maybe deeper. I wanted to be Leonard Cohen, but um, I think that 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 changed my perspective. I had the poor boy's desire to be rich and famous, and I realized that that was all just folly. And uh, I I I learned that what I cared about was witness. So witness has been the main drive for me since then. And uh, fortunately, I've been able to ex you know express that over the years it's great yeah it's amazing how the world can surprise you sometimes huh it totally surprises you you have no idea you don't know what's coming witness this thing we're under now you mm -hmm. know i i it was odd for me and this shutdown has been a little fraught because i traveled through on the last legs of touring uh which is now gone all my events are gone ahead of me. But, uh, you know, I was in places that were shutting down around me and uh, canceling as I traveled. And, uh, uh, you know, I was in Manhattan when I 
shouldn't have been, but I had some responsibilities I had to do. And then things started closing down. And finally, when I got to California, the day I got there and got off the plane, my event was canceled because the college closed. And then I was stuck there for a few days before I could get home. And that was kind of weird, you know, shelter in place in a hotel room <laughs> as the world started to burn. So we've been playing out the 14 days here in the house to make sure that uh, there are no symptoms. Um, but yeah, you don't know what's going to come, good or bad. It, it pays to stay uh, flexible. Bounce like a Super Bowl, man. <laughs> <laughs> for, sure, for sure. All right. Cool stuff. Um, so getting into the questions now. Yeah. Uh, so what's prompted you to to write The Devil's Highway? Was it this this sense that you had from from your younger years of, you know, trying to help? Well, there it, it's there it, there's uh it's an interesting genesis. I wrote that book because it was assigned to me, but I tried to duck out of it. My first books were nonfiction books about Tijuana and about the work with migrants and so forth. I had three of them in a row. And, um, but honestly, my poetry is about that world and my fiction pretty much always echoes that world. So it's just been what I did. And, um, you know, any, any writer who's watching or listening or whatever will, will know that the careers go up and down, you know, and it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. And mine was definitely on that downward slope. In fact, my my roller coaster went into a tunnel underground and I was disappearing when uh, Little Brown, the editor in at Little Brown, contacted me and asked me if I'd like to write that book. And I originally said no. And he said, why? And I said, well, I didn't intend to be border boy for the rest of my life. There are things I want to write other than that. Um, but I said, all the deaths in that story are overwhelming to me. And I don't know if I can shoulder the responsibility to represent those dead men well. Uh, and the last thing was, I did not want to deal with the Border Patrol. I yeah. dealt with them directly. And I, I thought, I'm not going to, I don't want to do this. And he was a smart editor. He said, can I just ask you one question? And I said, sure. And he said, do you trust anyone else to write it? And I said, hell no. And he said, well, then. So my fate was sealed. <laughs> and that's how that's how it started. Legend is born. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, I didn't know if anybody would read the book. You know, I, I didn't know if anybody would care. And um, my desire was to, to make a, a statement about these men and their suffering to possibly make people who are in the comfort of their North American homes, because I wrote it for American readers, for sure, um, you know, in comfort and safety and full of opinions to think about the human cost of what what happened and to understand, because a lot of times I think the information is just dead wrong about who migrants are, you know, and now it's not even really a Mexican phenomenon. It's people fleeing genocide and and starvation and violence you know in, in central america and so forth and so one could never stop telling these stories you know you could keep telling them forever hoping somebody will listen and i think people do and things change as you go and it's it's only gotten more important over over the years now especially with the um ongoing situation you know caravans and and just uh, the the whole thing really as we've seen in Celaya together um oh, yeah, yeah absolutely but um you know uh, there are other other factors now coming in that, that I've been trying to address in some of my fiction which is you know climate refugees it's not just people seeking a job or, or, or quote a better life yeah. we've gotten to the point where people are simply seeking life yeah. and uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon and i think now that coronavirus is starting to rampage you know i'm i'm really concerned about india i'm really concerned about africa it's in iran it's yeah. in mexico yeah. though mexico is a complete denial and they're not paying much attention to it um, 
you know, I don't know what the, yeah, I don't know what the, what the, uh, what the map will look like by this time next year, but I think it's going to be different. All right. And uh, why, why do you think that it's important that we consider um, uh, migration even today? I mean, of course, it's of a special importance today, as you've said, with the pandemic, with the changing world we're living in, but uh, particularly considering your work with the Devil's Highway, why, why is it still important today? Why does it resonate so much even today? Uh, sadly, it's a problem that does not go away. My first book came out in 1993. It was about this subject. I've been writing about, I've been talking about it anyway, and working on it since the 70s. I've been writing about it and publishing journalism about it since the 80s. So I'm a little tired, honestly. I feel like I keep preaching the same message over and over and over again. It takes a while, I think, for the, uh, the comfortable and the coddled to understand reality that being said you know all you have to do is go to parts of louisiana or parts of you know appalachia or west virginia there you know it's not it's not a racial issue it's not a a, a latino latinx issue yeah. it's a worldwide issue of haves and have nots and you know i don't know what the solution is my job is to try to learn everything i can and then i I try to send dispatches back to people so that they can see what I've seen. And then together we go forward and try to find more things and learn things. So, you know, as I was telling you before we started now on the Devil's Highway, there's a, a life-saving station with a, a big tank of water that's attended to every week by essentially relief workers. And they've, they've named it after me and they put it on the Devil's Highway itself. That's a little thing, but to me, it's the, the, the most amazing thing to ever come from writing a word. Um, but the reality is that bit by bit, person by person, things happen to try to make us survive a little easier on the earth. Um, you know, I'm astonished that evangelical Christians take such umbrage when people try to help you know, the, 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 the pilgrim, um, you know, you can, you can challenge them to a Bible competition and say, look, I'll, I'll buy you a Hyundai. If you win <laughs> brand new Hyundai, tell yeah. me all the scriptures where Jesus told you not to help the widow and the orphan, the traveler. So those things are, are always, you know, on my mind. Um, it's, it's almost a, uh, so uh, they say in Spanish, una quijotada. you're like Don Quixote with this mad quest. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and you, you, you know, Pastor Ignacio, he's the same way. There's so yeah. many of us trying to just make this journey a little less fraught and awful. We, um, our last, uh, one of our last um, articles was actually about the, the good Pastor Ignacio. And he had a very good quote, you know, speaking of the Bible that um, he said, I was a stranger and you invited me in. That, right. and that, that's what he lives off of with his... Uh, that's right. His ...belief with the migration situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a brilliant man. And, you know, it's, it's funny because um, sometimes when you're dealing with a guy like that, there are two levels or, or hundreds of levels, but, you know, you always think of him as a pastor, but he's also a lawyer. So, you know, he's a he's a great negotiator and litigator on his own right. The man that trained me to do that kind of work was a pastor himself, but he was also uh, a former uh, military man. He was, a, you know, he'd been in combat in the army. So he was actually a genius at, uh, he was like a general to us. And he saw us as soldiers. And in that way, he was a relentless man. But... Um, beneath that sort of general patent exterior was this very tender-hearted sweet almost zen man um so i think all of those all of those leaders have something profound going on that that shows you these depths and shadows underneath the service element of it 
and it makes them heroic. But what's really great about that is that they inspire the people around them to take heroic action too. And I think in this world, as it stands now, just extending your hand to somebody who needs it is heroic. It's a very selfish era. And, uh, you know, there are so many ways, even small ways. I used to think when I was younger that there was no hope because I couldn't save the world. But I realized that that's not my job to save the world. But if I see somebody who needs a sandwich, that's easy. You know, yeah. if somebody needs some money, that's, that's, that's easy. Especially now, I never had money until now. So those little ways, you know, little ways. And I think the genius of somebody like Ignacio is he inspires people. You can trust him. He's the real deal. He doesn't have a secret agenda. He'll be straight up with you about what his agenda is. And that's yeah. what he does. So true. So true. And uh, though you can't help, uh, so you can't save the world, you do, no. do work on a lot of projects, though. That, I do. As, I as do. you were mentioning before, you worked with the Samaritans and you work with uh, Pastor Ignacio at Abba House in Celaya. Tell us about some other projects which you work with, which maybe people might get inspired to get involved with themselves. Oh, there, there's so many. No More Deaths, also known as No Mas Muertes in Tucson. You know, they're the ones who just uh, went through the, the couple of trials trying to incarcerate one of the lovely young men who do the work for 20 years in federal prison. They, uh, they won. They prevailed. But there, there are so many ways to do things. Um, you know, I, I do things with a group here called the Young Center, which uh, is in Chicago uh, represents unaccompanied minors. You know, we help them out. Um, just there's, there's, there's so many. You can, you can throw a, a, a pebble in any pond and you'll find <laughs> things to do. You know, for example, um, he also here in Chicago, there's a group called Bernie's Book Bank, which is wonderful because it doesn't have any kind of agenda that you could be against. What they do is they provide libraries to disadvantaged children, brand new books. Oh, yeah. And uh, Brian Floriani, who runs it, is just a, a brilliant organizer. And he gets books, brand new books. And uh, they have a project in which they deliver a library of, I believe it's six new books. And he wants every poor and disadvantaged child in Illinois to have a library. And he's done a couple of million families so far. And, wow. uh, you know, they have dreams of going nationally. And I want to be in on that. I want to be, you know, driving around in Bernie's book bank truck, giving books to kids. I, I want to do that. And, um, you know, I work with uh, 826, you know, Dave Ager's wonderful group for, for kid literacy, and they have centers all over the country. So, uh, you know, we do fundraisers with them. And um, just before the virus hit, did an event at the 826 Chicago uh, Center with two of their young writers and then a, a fellow author. <laughs> seems pretentious but a published author a friend of mine Rebecca Mackay so it was the two of us and the two young girls and uh, you know that you can do an event in front of the public but those two teenaged writers are treated the same as two grizzled veterans with a zillion books out is really amazing to see so you know you can find any any number of ways to help Great. And um, all right. So staying on the topic of books, you've written The Devil's Highway in a somewhat informal style. How do you think that helps the reader? Um, or what effects rather did you hope to have? Yeah, I just write the way I write. And when the the contract was offered to me, the uh, editor said, I want this to be the ultimate Luis Urea book. Write it whatever way you want. Write it whatever way you need. Um, but what we want is for you to create the Trojan horse. We want you to send this story, which most Americans will think of as an immigration story slash true crime story, 
but fill it with every secret, everything you know, and everything you learn about the border and the milieu and all of that. So um, it was the first time somebody had been able to take apart one of those organizations from top to bottom, for example. My family are in the ambassadorial and consular corps of Mexico. So they opened all these doors to Mexican secrets. And weirdly, after a lot of struggle, the border patrol took me in too and told me their secrets. So I thought, you know, here's here's my chance. And I was very angry. The more I de dealt with that book, I was very angry. And so I thought, I've got to um, express my anger in a, a vivid sense without ending every sentence with comma, you bastards. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to be accusatory to anybody. I just wanted to tell the story. Um, and that's the way it came out. And um, I was probably thinking about writers I used to love that just swung for the far wall, you know, Hunter Thompson or somebody, Charles Bowden, nonfiction writers. And I thought, I'm just going to let, I'm going to let my voice go. Partially maybe to keep myself sane, but also I think it was trying to reflect the general milieu. There's not a lot of genteel stuff involved in, in that world. There's not a lot of uh, nice manners and having a little tea and some scones. It's, it's, it's gut bucket stuff. Yeah. Right. So uh, I wanted it to be vivid. I wanted it to be shocking. Um, but I also wanted it to be a viscerally moving experience. So um, of all the, the sort of writerly fireworks that might be in that book, the section that is the most popular, if, I, if, if you can say popular, is the section where I talk about the stages of death, heat death. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I didn't know that stuff. I wouldn't have known it except the Border Patrol sent me their expert on that and then doctors chimed in and helped me write that so you know there are moments like that that you have to take absolute care with the material and, the, and sure. try not to show off and other places where there is a human sorrow or tragedy you want to honor that um yeah. and so but a lot of a lot of the prose also just comes from direct statements from the survivors so I wanted to reflect all that milieu. And it comes out, it really feels at certain points like you're walking there with them through the drudgery of it. It's it's harsh. <laughs> I, I felt hot when reading it for sure. Well, thank you. I, you know, it was funny that um, one of the things that happened during the investigation was the federal defender who was dealing with Mendes, you know, the, the coyote that led those guys, yeah. Um, he gave me all of the interrogation videos of those survivors as they were brought into the emergency room. There was a camera set up on the bed and there were U.S. agents grilling man by man all the survivors as they were just first getting triaged. And then what was amazing was that the federales were at the next bed back interviewing these men also. And so when I was going through these tapes and watching them, my wife's a journalist, so she can type 200 times faster than I can. So I was listening to this and translating the interviews to her and she entered them all. And then we went back because I realized I'd have to listen more carefully and hear the other interviews too. And so all of that material was, was vivid and raw and you could see these men, they were taking urine samples from them as they were trying to talk. They were putting in IVs into their arms. And there's one guy, I think it's in the book, but he's talking and he looks down and water starts coming out of his skin because he has so many puncture wounds from cacti. And I remember thinking at the time, and I think I put it in the book, I don't remember, but it was like an old... Bugs Bunny cartoon or something, you know, when they get shot and then they drink water and water yeah. squirts out. And the man started to laugh and say, look, I'm leaking. And he was rubbing his arms. It was eerie. But those moments, aside from the fact that I lived in Tucson for a while, um, I've always been a desert rat. 
I always wanted, I always used to hike and camp in the desert. And I knew that part of Arizona. So I say in the book, I, I wasn't with them, but I know what the dawn is like at that time of year. So all those factors kind of came in together. All right. Uh, what, what cultural effect do you think that this has had, uh, particularly, of course, on the U.S., but in general, like what, what impact do you feel? I mean, this is a book you wrote in 2004. Am I, yeah, was it original? I wrote, I wrote it, I wrote it, started the investigation in 2001, mm -hmm. um, worked on the investigation until probably 2000, late 2002, um, drafted the book 2000. To 2003, and then it finally came out. One of the things that had to happen was I had to be vetted by attorneys, a bank of attorneys who went through every page and made me, uh, you know, give provenance for everything I said. So it took a little while. But um, I don't know if it, I don't know what the cultural, I mean, that, that, that's a weird question for me to think about. I, I, uh, I know that a lot of people have gone into the deserts to help because of that book which moves me i know that uh you know That's jeanette napolitano way, back in the day read it and she wanted everybody in congress to read it which was i mean it's had a life you know and um if nothing else just making people aware of it you know i'm sure that probably some volunteerism followed from it i'm i know that financial ac activism followed it um not to be a name dropper, but I, I, I once did a, an event with Sting, the singer. Um, yeah, yeah. And we were on stage and we were talking, answering questions from the audience about stuff. And uh, someone asked him about the song Fragile, which is kind of a classic Sting song about our yeah. fragility as people. And he said he has mixed feelings about that song. Because though he was proud of it, because it was a song of witness, you know, make asking us to consider people who, like us, are fragile. Um, he said when 9-11 happened, it ended up being sort of an unofficial theme whenever there were scenes of people sad or suffering or running from smoke or weeping. This would play in the background. And it has become the kind of song that whenever there's a catastrophe or crisis comes back to life and he said you know it's made him a fortune but he feels conflicted about every cent that it makes because it it relies on tragedy and you know the devil's highway it's still going through waves of becoming a bestseller over and over again and it's been out since 2004. Most times your book gets, you know, six weeks, a couple of months, and then fades away. This one doesn't. And I realized after talking to Sting that part of the reason was that every time something awful happens on the border, people start buying the book again. And so I feel like he does about that song that it's it's it makes me sad that it's a book that's fueled by awfulness because the awfulness never stops. And so when, you know, Stephen Miller started his putting kids in cages programs, the book came yeah, back yeah. to life again. So um, on the other hand, maybe, you know, it's, it's a God's little joke to have a, a, a funky antidote floating around when people get strange about the border. I don't know. It's hard for me to, it's hard for me to judge it. Yeah, well, you the the you got the water tank out of it. That's like a landmark. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people will be remembering the Luis and Cindy Urea water <laughs> station out in the desert, it's, Devil's Highway. Now it's so cool. And you know, if you remember in the book how the border patrol put up their own towers to guide people through the desert, and uh, you know they're not fools. I mean, those towers are also so that they can arrest people easily but they do save lives. And it's really odd because the Luis and Cindy Urea water station is around the curve of the Devil's Highway from the Border Patrol Tower. It's so, I mean, you could get in position and probably see both locations if you have the right angle. And I thought, this is, this is crazy, man. This, it's such a weird, a weird meeting of two conflicting minds trying to do the same thing. For sure.
Um, so when did you start with uh, migrants? When did you start working with migrants a bit more intimately? When was the first time you really got in the thick of it? 1978. And what was the circumstances surrounding that? I told you, after my father's death, I joined the uh, organization called Spectrum Ministries. I became their translator. Um, so I was thrust into uh, quite, a, quite a swamp, actually, because, you know, they were Americans, almost all of them, North Americans. Um, and they were out of a Baptist church. I was no Baptist. <laughs> but but uh, I loved the pastor and I loved the people. And, uh, you know, being a translator, you are the one empowered to speak yeah. and trusted to speak by the boss man who was a preacher. Um, but also, you then have to have the, uh, the very difficult job of listening. And once people know you're actually listening, they open the floodgates. I could write 10 books even today about all the things I saw and all the things I had to experience there. And it was, it was difficult. A lot of blood, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of burned flesh. I saw people's guts. I, you know, it was tough. A lot of beauty also, no question, but, you know, very painful, painful things every around every corner. And one of the things I learned was this, gentleman the the pastor his name was pastor von v-o-n he was actually a german a, a a fallen german baron erhard george von trutchler the third sorry could you repeat uh, that we we lost connection for we a got a glitch there. he was a, yeah. a he was a fallen german baron from a german family that that uh you know was on hard times in the united states but his full name was Erhard George von Trutschler III. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, uh, he kind of saved my, my mind a few times because I lost it several times there. And uh, he would talk me through it. But he pointed out that the reality was twofold. One, we could not change things. Any place you go where there's desperate trouble, around the corner, there's more desperate trouble. And around the corner from there is more desperate trouble. So you do the best you can with the people that, you, you know, you're, you're brought. The second thing he said, which has stuck with me forever, and maybe why I write about this. He said, people think that I'm doing this to save Mexicans. And he said, I'm not. I'm doing this to save gringos. Gringos are the ones who need to learn what life is really about. And so he always, the feature was always van loads of people going along with his work crew. And he did hundreds of thousands of people. And he said, the USA needs this knowledge so that they can start to change. And that's from a hardcore conservative guy, but that's what he had seen in the field. So I think that that was always in me. And that's, I think, partially where the idea of writing witness came from, you know. Yeah, let's let's keep putting it in people's faces and see if we can get people to care. What, what, what was the demographic like back then as far as the people coming across the border? Was it mostly Mexican, first of all? Uh, yeah, impoverished Mexican people from the south and a lot of indigenous people. Okay. There were a lot of, uh, of uh, mixed tech people, um, Tarascan people from Michoacan and Chinanteca people. Those were the three tribal groups that I used to work with. And then later on, Maya people started to come in greater numbers. So, you know, around the time of the Devil's Highway, when I was hanging out in Sasabe and visiting with the beta group Mexican cops and stuff, they were Mayans. And they didn't even speak Spanish. And, uh, you know, you could really see uh, you could really see the demographic changing. But amongst those Mayan people, you know, because the Mayan nation doesn't have a border with Guatemala, the Mayan universe is the great oblong 
that's where Guatemala right. people you were coming. You had to chop us, right? Right, yeah. And people coming from Belize and so forth. Um, so all of that was happening. And then th there were just waves of, of interesting, you know, people, Guatemalan people, Salvadoran people fleeing mm -hmm. violence, particularly. Um, you know, so, but that's, that's, that's basically how it went. It was mostly Mexican people from the South who were, you know, and, and when they were rebuffed sometimes by the border, they had nowhere to go and they would drift to the garbage dump because it was, you could stake a claim. You could build a house out of, you know, thrown away wood and start picking trash right away. Um, so that was, that was the, you know, Mariano Azuela, wrote this classic called Los de Abajo, right? Mm. In English, it was translated as the underdogs, which isn't really a good title, but they were Los de Abajo. They were the forgotten ones of all Mexico uh, and certainly forgotten by us. And as a writer, I can just paint this quickly for you, but the Tijuana garbage dump in those days was on a hill, okay, south of Tijuana, and it had a beautiful view of San Diego and the American border. So the people were sitting up there dying of hunger, sometimes of cold, believe it or not, disease everywhere, and they could see San Diego. They could see, you know, all the, all the. So I used to tell people, it's like living outside the gate of Disneyland. There's no way people aren't gonna try to get in. You hear my stupid dog back there? My dog's, <laughs> my dog's challenging the neighbors to a death match. They're probably just as bored as we are. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And have you seen a big shift in the demographic since then? Sure. The late seventies has the has the types of people, the people, the countries, the faces. Has it changed very much? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, part of it is climate refugees joining in, but Tijuana. It's full of Haitian people now, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, Venezuelans are on their way. I know Brazilians have come. Uh, yeah. You know, there was a time when Argentina was in trouble and people from Argentina and Colombia came for a, a phase. Mm. You know, there are Eritreans coming from Africa. Oh, you yeah. know, there's a movement worldwide, I think, of humanity just seeking refuge. Uh, and, you know, we're still the, that, that shining fantasy land where everything's going to be good. That's what they believe. Um, and uh, so here they come, you know, in Mexico. Ignacio, I'm sure, told you this himself. But, you know, one thing he said to me, which I thought was brilliant, was, yeah, people come through here heading north and they're migrants. But when they can't get in and they filter back, then they're refugees because most of them can't go home. And Mexico, who doesn't want them, is inheriting them. So there's, there's a huge demographic happening, happening right now in central Mexico, you know? And I've been writing about that in some fantasy stuff about, in trying to project it into what a future scenario would be. But um, yeah, the, it's, it's always changing. It's always changing. And, you know, there's a if you look it up, you can Google this. I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but the majority of Americans who keep going to Mexico and stay there are living there illegally. Irony of irony. Yeah, I Many of them, that. conservatives, who sure don't want illegals in the United States, but they have no problem grabbing a piece of the new pie, which is coastal Mexico. It's so pretty yeah. and tropical and cheap. So, you know, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. If we were honest... I think we'd be better just just seeing that everyone is complicit in this. And, you know, what do we do? What do we do? I've been working with some uh, climate scientists lately. You yeah. Know, one, one guy here in Chicago, I asked him if he'd be interested in helping me because I wanted to not to name names of any leaders, but someone infamously referred to the third world as shithole countries. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to write uh, the shithole gospel, looking at what those bad, quote, bad places are doing to actually save the world. And it's it's quite moving when you see, 
You know, Mexico yeah. is reforesting Honduras, for God's sake. They're trying to reforest the Mexico City plateau up there, you know, to start cleaning the air. And, and you know, it's a lot of stuff going on around the world that we don't know about. The never extreme of irony sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. All right. We can start rounding up a little bit here. I've got a couple questions left for you. Yes, sir. Um, so first and foremost, you can get quick plug if you've got anything that you've just recently released or anything people should be keeping a lookout for, uh, anything <laughs> not too uh, top uh, secret. Uh, let's see. I, I, I've i sold the House of Broken Angels to Hulu TV Network, so there'll be a show probably who knows when, whenever they go back into production. Um, I don't know if you know McSweeney's magazine is... It's, well, they call it a magazine, but it's really kind of a quarterly book that uh, people like Dave Eggers and so forth publish. And it's quite lovely. And yeah. their last one was about, you know, the, the United States and or the world in 2045, when the tipping point is supposed to happen with global warming, etc. And uh, I have a piece in there called The Night Drinker. And uh, it's all these issues we're talking about. What's going to happen when all hell does break loose? climate wise and yeah. what's it going to be like in Mexico City and so that's how I got to know the the climate scientists because McSweeney's wisely paired each of us writers with a scientist so that we would have a solid background in our material um that's it <laughs> right well a lot of a lot to look forward to once we get out of lockdown huh <laughs> yes sir all right I well, guess for everyone for everyone watching, something to keep a lookout for. <laughs> and to end on a note that we always like to end on, okay. um, you could tell the world one thing about migration. What would that be? One thing about migration. Or, you know, and like about the situation, something that you'd like them, like the world to know about what's going on. Yeah. I think I said it earlier, you know, it's a, it's a worldwide issue now. And I think if you're a person of faith, like I am, I like to present myself as Mr. Political, but I'm, I'm really fueled by something else. Um, you know, it's a, it's a call to us to be human, to reach out uh, in any way we can, to be aware, you know, to be aware of our manifest blessings and to take action on some level because that person that you know propaganda would tell you is some invader coming here to steal your jabs to take your welfare to take your education to, it's it's not the case and right now all of us are under lockdown almost universally in the united states except guess who the migrant workers who are working as if this hadn't happened to pick our food, to keep us alive under great risk for their own health and safety. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe if anything, the secret message is to be grateful, to be grateful to those people that we disparage. Because if you sit down to have some vegetables or fruit, brown hands probably got those for you uplifting message to end on then well thanks for <laughs> thanks for taking the time out thank you appreciate, it, appreciate it um hope you have a happy quarantine yeah everyone, everyone watching i suppose i'm keeping busy man <laughs> all, right. All, right. all right all right talk to you later